Today, looking at the hyperbola again, just getting into a little bit more detail. In the last lesson, we spent time looking at just where the vertices were and where the asymptotes were and how things might move around if the center altered. Remember, the standard form was to have the vertices on the x-axis, but you can also just modify things very slightly and get the vertices on the y-axis, just swapping the x and y around. So let's pick up from where we got to. So yes, our hyperbola, that vertical slice down across both parts of our cone to give us that conic section. And this is what we were looking at really last time. We've got those vertices at minus a and a. If we've got that standard form and then we've got the parametric equations, um, which we're not really too interested in as far as we're concerned on the internal and then the equations of the asymptotes. If we wanted it to be the other way around, we just swap the x's and the y's over in those relationships, okay, and just move them around. So just as a bit of a start, just to warm you up, um, this is going to be one of those spots where I ask you to pause the video and just see what you can do. So we've got two very similar looking um, algebraic expressions, al algebraic um, equations in effect. Um, what I'd like you to do is to see if you can figure out what these two conics are and plot them. So make sure you plot the important points that you know about, any important lines, those sorts of things. Make sure you label them nicely. All right, so when you're sketching, you should always be trying to make sure that you're giving enough information over to the person who's going to look at your sketch. Do they know enough about what it looks like? Yeah, it might be a hyperbola, but what does that hyperbola look like? Can you give them enough information about it? So pause the video now if you want to have a go, and then we'll come back and have a look in a few minutes. Okay, so let's have a look. So this first one, the one that we've got on the, uh, I'll bring up my pointer again, my laser. Um, this first one over here has got the minus. This one's got the plus on the right-hand side. So the left-hand side one's got the minus. This one is a hyperbola. That's what we were looking at last time. So if we just step on through that, we should be able to say that A is um, 5 and B is 3. Square root of 25, square root of 9, 5 and 3. We're going to then have that the um, vertices are going through um, 5 and minus 5 on the x-axis. And we can also say that the asymptotes should be at plus or minus, well, y is plus or minus 3 fifths of x because we get the 3 there and we get the 5 there. So we should end up with something that looks a little bit like that. Okay, it's through minus 5 and 5. And then there's dotted asymptotes. Let me just sketch on here so we got that so we can see if I change my point to the pen. Because we've got A on that first one is 5 and B is 3. Then we've got the asymptotes. Remember, we can give them both at the same time. Y is just plus or minus um, three-fifths of X. Okay, that's what those two are. You can see from our sketch probably quite neatly. Go back to the laser pointer. When I'm at X is five, I'm at Y is three on that asymptote. Okay, when I'm at X is 10, I'm at Y equals six. It's just gone off the screen a little bit. Okay. Um, if we move on to the next one then, so the next one is an ellipse. And we've got the plus in there, we've got an ellipse. And we can see that the major axis, well, A is still 5 and B is still 3. So the major axis will still be going through minus 5 and 5. They'll be the end points of that major axis. The major axis is going to have length 10. The minor axis will have length 3. So it'll cut at 3 and minus 3 here. So if we just have a look at what that looks like on top of there. All right, so our ellipse fits inside, if you like, our hyperbola. We've just got the ellipse in there. So today we're going to have a look at the focus directrix property again, which we had a look at for the ellipse. Um, and we remember we've got this fixed straight line called the directrix, this fixed point called the focus. And the focus directrix property defines all conics for us as well, as well as thinking about a cone. The focus directrix property defines all conics by this ratio called the eccentricity. So all conics can be derived from that. And this focus directrix property says that uh, for a conic, that's the locus of all points such that their distance to the focus is a fixed proportion of their distance to the directrix. And the, that fixed proportion is the eccentricity. That's what it's called. So if I measure from 
the point on my conic to the focus. That is going to be E lots of the distance to the directrix. And we know that we have these things coming about. If E is zero, we get a circle. We looked at E being between zero and one, giving an ellipse. Parabola we haven't looked at yet. That will be coming to next. And if E is greater than one, we have a hyperbola. Okay, so that's what we're looking at now. And here for um, a hyperbola, it really gives us an idea of, sort of steepness. We get a bit more of an idea of steepness. It's fatness for the ellipse. It's a bit more about steepness for the hyperbola. So let's just have a quick look at what these things might look like in practice. So we've got our vertices for our, um, sorry, our vertices here where we're crossing the axis, aren't we? We've got our vertices, we've got the center, okay? We've got a focus and we've got a second focus and we'll have a directrix and we'll have a second directrix. Symmetry again, as with the ellipse, are in the focus directrix property. The, eccentri uh, the eccentricity is one. So the distance to the focus is more than the distance to the directrix. Okay, because the eccentricity is bigger than one. The distance to the focus is more than the distance to the directrix in that ratio. Um, we can say that the focus is C0, like we were saying, and this one be minus C0, and the same way that we were saying that for the ellipse as well. So let's just build up a little bit more like we did for the ellipse. So the eccentricity is greater than one. And in this case, we've got B squared is A squared, E squared minus one. That's changed ever so slightly. You might want to flip back and have a look at what you wrote down, what that looked like for um, the ellipse. But we've still got the Bs, As, Es, and, and a one kicking around in there. It looks very, very similar. Okay, you'll see there's not an awful lot of difference in there. But it's this way around. E, remember, is bigger than one. So we square it, we're going to get something bigger than one. But when we subtract one away from it, okay, it's, we're going to get this. Um, it's going to drop down and B squared will end up coming out. Okay from there. We can also say, just rearranging that, think about how we'd have done that. If I'd have divided through by the a squared to get b squared over a squared, then add one onto the other side, I'm left with e squared. So we can use that to work out the eccentricity if we want. Just do one plus b squared over a squared and square root it. For the foci and directrices, once we know the eccentricity, a times the eccentricity as it did for um, the ellipse, plus or minus that will give us the position of the foci. Remember, E is bigger than one, so the focus moves beyond the uh, the, the uh, vertex, and the directrices are A over E. E is bigger than one, so that'll be less than A, so it'll move back towards the origin. The directrix moves back that way. We did see there were some perhaps more useful forms for us to use this um, to work out with all this for uh, an ellipse. And we've got the same sort of thing. If we say the foci are plus or minus C0, then let's just do a bit of scribbling on here. Let me change to my pen. So we're saying now that effectively C is AE, because that's what it's saying up there, isn't it? That the foci are AE. So if we're saying C is that AE, coming back up here, I've got A squared times E squared. Well, A squared times E squared will be C squared. So B squared is C squared and the minus one times the a squared is a squared. So I've got this bit here. Yeah, that's what that's giving me. I've got the b squared. I've got this first a squared times the e squared is c squared. And then I've got the a squared times the minus one is an a squared. Well, we can just rearrange that if we like to something that looks a little bit like Pythagoras again. c squared is a squared plus b squared. Okay, just add the a squared on the other side. And similarly, just coming back from here, we can say the eccentricity could just be given to us then by what C over A is. That's going to work as well. So these forms can be quite useful. These ones can be quite useful to use um, working that way around. If you don't want to get the eccentricity first or you're not interested in the eccentricity at all, you can just go straight for those forms. So just in summary, they're the important bits, I think, around this. If we've got that hyperbola, okay, A has to be greater than B. We've got an eccentricity greater than 1 because otherwise we won't have a hyperbola. E squared is 1 plus B squared over A squared, but we can say it has foci at plus or minus C0, where C squared is A squared plus B squared, and we can also say C is AE, okay, to give us another way to get the eccentricity. So we may as well have a look at a question. Here's a hyperbola then. 
x squared over 16 minus y squared over 4 is 1. a is bigger than b. Yeah, a is 4, square root of 16, and b is 2, square root of 4. Let's get the eccentricity then. That's what we're asked to do first of all. So we might as well use what we're told right at the top of the screen here. Just bear with me a second. Lost my point again. So we've got this formula here. Let's use that one. So we can just sub straight into that to get e squared and then square root at the end to say what e is. So if we build up through there, e squared then will be 1 plus b squared over a squared, which is 1 plus a quarter. Yeah. Now we've got b squared over a squared. b squared is 4. a squared is, let's just bring him in again, a squared is um, 16. So you've got 4 over 16 for b squared over a squared. But obviously that cancels to a quarter. All right, so I'll just jump straight in there and said it's a quarter. And 1 plus a quarter is 5 quarters. That was e squared. Square root it. We can square root the 4, but we can't square root the 5. So we've got root 5 over 2. That's the eccentricity. Okay, that is bigger than 1, which we know it should be. So if you square root 5, that's going to be bigger than square root 4. Square root 4 is 2. And then you've got to divide it by 2, because that's what it's saying to do there. So that's going to be bigger than 1. The coordinates of the foci. We've got a couple of ways we could go about doing this now. Okay, we've got a couple of ways we could go about doing this because of what we know. The coordinates of the foci, we know that we can get these by doing C is AE. But we can also use C squared, C squared is A squared plus B squared. We've worked out E, so it might be easier to do the AE bit, but I'm going to show you both just so you can see where they both come out from. So if we choose C equals AE, A um, is 4. So we've got to do four lots of root five over two, four lots of root five over two. Well, if we're times in that by four, yeah, we're times in by four and we're dividing by two, we're just multiplying by two, yeah. Four lots of half root five is two lots of root five. And then the other way around, if we did c squared is a squared plus b squared, a squared plus b squared, a squared is 16, b squared is four, add them together, you get 20. Square root of 20, can you remember how to deal with your square roots? I'm going to come up the top of the screen here. Square root of 20, remember? Okay, 20 has a square factor of 4. 4 is in there times by 5, all underneath my square root. And the 4 can come out because we can square root it. So we get 2 root 5. No big surprise because that's what we had before. These two should give us exactly the same. All right. In practice, you just use one of those and it's whichever way around you wanted to do it. If you hadn't worked out the eccentricity to start with, you'd have probably use C squared is A squared plus B squared. If you had worked out the eccentricity, well, why not just use it? Now we're going to say where the asymptotes are. So the asymptotes, OK, we have from last time, they are Y equals plus or minus B over A times by X. So I'm oh, sorry, I didn't finish off saying where the foci were. Yeah, if that's 2 root 5, then we're going to get plus or minus 2 root 5, 0, aren't we? But then for our asymptotes, y is plus or minus b over ax, b over a again, okay, b is 2, a is 4, b over a is a half then, yeah, because b over a, bring it back, b over a is going to be 2 over 4, well, 2 over 4, why not just write it simply? We should always write it as simply as we can. 2 over 4 gives us y is plus or minus um, a half of x. There are asymptotes. Sketch it. So we should be able to sketch it now. Okay, the eccentricity doesn't really help us that much with the sketch. The position of the foci, okay, that's quite interesting. We can mark those on our sketch if we wanted to. We know also where the um, vertices are. We're going to get plus or minus um, 4, comma 0 because a is 4. Um, and we've got our asymptotes, y equals plus or minus half x. So the asymptotes and the vertices probably give us the most information about putting the sketch, but we might as well put on the foci as well now we've worked it out. So let's just step into that. We'll get something like this. Okay, our foci. I've done an approximation to 2 root 5 on here. So I said 2 root 5, okay, well, that is really... Um, I always seem to lose my pointer a bit, and I, uh, that is 4.47. So I can see that the foci actually on here, because I know the vertex is at 4, it's just moved on a little bit, which is what we know. It should move on a little bit, and it's just kind of the, the foci will be there approximately. And 
round about there. So they've moved on a little bit. Okay, so that's what's happened there. Those moved on a little bit out there. We've got our foci, we've got our asymptotes. Y equals plus or minus half X, yep. Um, flip to the pointer. When we've got X is 10, Y is 5, yep. And out the other way, when X is minus 10, we've got Y is minus 5. So we just got that nice asymptotes going through. Nice sketch. Might as well mark on our foci, giving us some idea as to whereabouts that is. And we've got our vertices. Okay, so that's the end of lesson two. There's going to be some questions set for you to have a go at um, in the Delta book. Um, so I'll give you some note on those in the classroom. The important things to remember, yeah, we already know what the form of the hyperbola is. We know eccentricity now is going to be greater than one. And we've got that expression for the eccentricity. Um, e squared is one plus b squared over a squared. Foci are plus or minus c zero, where c squared is a squared plus b squared. We could also use that uh, c is ae if you wanted to do that. The asymptotes, x is plus or minus b over ax, and the vertices are plus or minus a zero. Remember as well, you can still get things swapping around. So you might get your um, foci and your vertices are actually on the y-axis and not on the x-axis. And all that means is we end up doing our swapping around up here, doesn't it? Where we've got the y's here, we'd move them to the front and the x bits, we'd move those second. And then the same sorts of things would apply from there. We can move the center as well. We know that if we slide across or we slide up, we can move those sorts of things out too. Okay, so good luck with the exercise and I'll see you next time.